Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Today was day 36 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings, and the day involved uh, or centered around two small group discussions. In the morning, there was a group discussion, uh, a moderated discussion involving four paramedics who were involved in the events of the Mass Casualty, and then in the afternoon, again, a further moderated discussion involving two of the 911 operators who were in the operational uh, communication center on the day of the April 19th, uh, 2020. So into uh, the Sunday activities. So uh, I'm going to talk about that. It was, uh, there were some interesting things that came out of that and they were um, a small group discussion is uh, distinct from a round table discussion, which is again distinct from a witness panel, even though these are all involving groups and the commissioners will take uh, what they've heard from each of them uh, but uh, we'll discuss some of those distinctions there in a minute but the first thing i actually wanted to talk about was what we expected to have happen today but what did not which was the release of the big stop videos the videos from the big stop in enfield where the uh, the killer was was put down as uh, kirsten bagley one of the 911 operators i think aptly put it uh, those videos were supposed to be, or we were expecting, I think, to have them released this morning or today at some point, and also for the commissioners to uh, tell us about the application that had been made by Coldfoot's Publishing on behalf of Frank Magazine, made by lawyer David Hutt. I talked about this in my video yesterday, and according to the Frank Magazine article, uh, the commission was to discuss that application that was supposed to be heard today but it was resolved the videos are going to be released so we expected that there would be some discussion of that by the commissioners first thing this morning so uh, something's gone on there and but the commissioners felt no obligation to tell us uh, anything about it one way or another about the application itself or about its resolution or about any delay in the posting of the videos because they're still not posted to the Mass Casualty Commission website. This is uh, just approaching 5 p.m. here on uh, Monday the 13th. So, uh, anyway, we'll see. We'll see. We'll wait for those videos to be posted, but uh, there was an expectation uh, that they would be uh, at least discussed today. So, when they didn't, when the commissioners just went right into the proceedings today, I thought, well, maybe they'll address it at the end of the day because sometimes they'll do that and fewer people are watching and it's too late to make the evening news and all those sorts of considerations but they didn't mention it uh, at the breaks at the end of the day at any point during the day so uh, something's going on there and I'm sure um, Frank magazine or somebody will get to the bottom of that and tell us about it all right so uh, I'll bring you any updates on that as it uh, as it occurs now the like I say the small group sessions uh, that took place today uh, today this morning we had a uh, Jesse Brine, Jeff O'Coin, uh, Melanie Lowe, and Bruce Cox, all uh, paramedics, all involved in the events of the mass casualty. And then in the afternoon, we had Brian Green and uh, Kirsten Bagley uh, that were OCC uh, shift super, or sorry, uh, dispatchers, uh, 911 call takers, and um, acting uh, commanders as well within the uh, OCC center. So what uh, Commissioner Fitch, who did the introduction this morning, said that they, the purpose of these small group discussions is to give us a deeper understanding of the context and impact of the mass casualty. So really, it's if I'd summarize today, it would be like, well, what is not the factual narrative? These weren't witnesses in that sense. And, you know, of course, they're talking about things that happened. But anything that they mentioned from a, a factual nature, I mean, there were everything was consistent with what we have already in the foundational documents. But, you know, had they come out with anything vastly different, well, then they would have been recalled as actual witnesses. What today was really about was what is it like to be a paramedic or a 911 call taker under these kind of uh, very unusual circumstances? or ordinary circumstances as well, though that was brought up as a comparator point to these. So, you know, uh, it takes a kind of a special kind of a person to be in these kind of situations, because, uh, but somebody needs to do this, right? We need paramedics uh, that 
go into very difficult situations involving death, injuries, and so on. We need uh, 911 call takers to be able to be calm, uh, be organized, process details, and do all of those things without uh, losing their cool or or getting too emotionally you know, involved in the situation as it's unfolding. So we heard some of that and we could tell from the witnesses that that was sort of their mentality in, in each case. You know, the, after the fact, we heard about, you know, the difficulty in, in processing and the, the difficulty as they look back on what had taken place. But, you know, my impression from listening to the witnesses was that during the events, they were doing what needed to be done using their training uh, and behaved in a sort of a, a you know behaved in a calm uh, manner throughout the events uh, of course the 911 call takers in particular talked about you know it being organized chaos was one of the ways they put it and the number of calls that they had to take was just enormous but that they were you know head down doing their thing making sure that everything got processed there was an interesting, well, uh, a, a stat. Brian Green said between 11 and 11.30 a.m. on the 19th, there were 80 calls answered by seven people. Now, normally they have four people as call takers, four people as dispatchers. So making sure that, you know, all right, well, we'll call the fire department, call the ambulance, call whoever needs to be called, call the Truro Fire, you know, who, whoever needs to be called. Uh but on you know the on the 19th they had actually seven and five seven call takers and five dispatchers because of the situation that was ongoing and that uh between yeah between 11 and 11 30 those seven people took 80 phone calls and now mr green says some of them had to be you know deflected onto other call takers or else you know if or hung up on if the information all right you got all the information all right that's it you're done we're hanging up uh, but he said 99 percent of the information that was received was prop processed and properly processed so um you know they've looked at making a bunch of changes and now of course there's a new operational communication center it's not in Truro now it's in dartmouth and uh, they say that makes it easier to operate but all of those things are are changes that have happened since and actually uh brian green mentioned uh, that it was in part because of the commission being underway that some of these changes seem to have been made he didn't specify which ones but certainly i would think in all of these service providers that knowing that you're going to have to come and answer to these policies, these your structures, all of these things in a public commission would certainly make you want to take a good look at them and make sure that you're doing things proactively before it gets exposed publicly. So uh, it's a good thing, uh, you know, these there can be changes that are ongoing even before the report comes out. Back to the morning, uh, the uh, paramedics who were on call they had a few comments, you know, broad comments. One was that they felt that they were pulled in too close to the dangerous uh, areas in Portapique, that they should have been told by the RCMP to stage a little further away. So that was uh, a comment that, that came out a few times. And uh, they had very little information, or they felt they had very little information provided to them going into the situation, which would have helped them, you know, figure out better what they were supposed to be doing so uh, that was those were sort of operational issues you know in the early stages uh, miss Lowe talked about uh, taking the children the the four the blair mccully children the four of them to the hospital and you know that they were f describing events the that they'd witnessed in detail to her describing them in, in you know in frank detail and that she says, well, she, she held it together at the time and was listening to them and allowing them to say their piece, say what they felt they wanted to describe. But that looking back on it now, that it's just haunting uh, to, to think of them having gone through that. And then just the memory of the memory of her time with them. So um, unbelievably difficult to imagine. Uh, one of the other patients was uh, a good friend of her, she said, and that's changed their friendship. So you can imagine all of these things in, in difficult circumstances for paramedics, uh, not an easy job, but the biggest, I think, complaint issue that the four of them had was the after incident, uh, support. They had some peer support, but so, you know, that's difficult. And then plus you're laying this stuff on your peers who are also going out and having to do difficult work. So it's not really enough or that effective. And there was there was no offer of time off for them and there was no 
connection to the other service providers like the RCMP and fire to do a proper debriefing. And so they felt that that could have been handled a lot better from their perspective. Uh, the 911 call operators mentioned that as well, that there was some peer support, but not a lot of real follow-up in that. Uh, they maybe didn't feel they needed it quite as much as the, uh, the paramedics, but they mentioned that as well. Strikes me this, uh, you know, it reminded me a little bit of what we learned in the, the Desmond inquiry from, you know, the military. And here you have, you know, people that are going into a dangerous profession and, you know, the like likelihood that they're going to face something traumatic is, is a high likelihood. And then knowing that on the back end of that, they may not have the proper support. Boy, that seems like that would affect uh, recruitment and retention knowing that you're going into a dangerous situation. And when you come out on the other end, uh, your organization and, you know, your community or your, uh, your government, you may not have your back as a, an issue, you know, offer the proper level of support. So uh, I'm sure the commission will be looking at that because, you know, when you're asking, how did you, your experience, tell us about your experience of this. A lot of the issue was after the fact, looking back on it. So, um, we'll see if uh, some recommendations emerge uh, in that regard. You know, it struck me like during the events, all of, you know, everybody seemed to be able to hold it together. I mean, there were some emotions today recounting events. I did notice with the 911 call takers, and they are RCMP dispatchers, that they only really got emotional when they were talking about Chad Morris and Constable Chad Morrison and Constable Heidi Stevenson. Uh, you know, and talked about, well, it's, you can't lose, can't lose a member. All right. Well, everybody's life is important, but that seemed, um, anyway, maybe that's a necessary part of the mentality in order to do the job properly, uh, because you're dealing with people all the time and they're getting injured and dying. But, um, that's that kind of stuck out to me as well. So that was really, uh, it for today with, uh, those are some of the, the highlights. I think, um, there was, uh, you know, the, the evidence, I just want to say, the, like, the evidence that'll come from these witnesses today, you know, if it conflicts with factual evidence we've heard from other witnesses, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be preferred. It certainly wouldn't be. Any factual side of this, their evidence today is really going to be given very little weight by uh, the commissioners. It certainly would be, you know, because of the circumstances. They're not under oath. Uh, there's no cross-examination. They're not witnesses in that sense. Um... It's really just to get an idea of what it was like to be in your shoes, in your position uh, during one of these events. So I think we did get that impression from the witnesses today. Uh, difficult jobs to do, not jobs everybody would want to do, and not a mentality everybody would want to be able to uh, adopt. Uh, so, all right, so tomorrow there's two further uh, small group discussions. Uh, the morning it'll be different, a, ver a variety of service providers from victim services, from the medical examiner's office, and a funeral home director. And then in the afternoon it'll be two elected officials, uh, Tom Taggart, the MLA for Colchester North, and uh, Christine Blair, who is the uh, mayor of the Colchester municipality, municipality of Colchester. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time.